in the middle of all this free agent frenzy, there's been a lot of different moves, but there's two in particular that have got a lot of debate. And so, of course, we're talking about DeAndre Hopkins being traded uh, from the Texans and his whole issue with Coach Bill O'Brien. And then there is Slay being traded from the Lions and his whole issues with Coach Matt Patricia. So I decided, let me debate, or not really debate because it's just me, but let's talk about both and see if we can come to a decision of which one was worse. So a little bit of background on both, and then we'll kind of go through it. So DeAndre Hopkins, arguably, I would say, most people would agree, top five receiver in the league. Some would say the top receiver in the league. Um, he is getting ready to turn 28, so not like super old. And, of course, receivers can play uh, for a good while, but he's been in the league for a minute, but still producing at a high level. He gets traded from the Houston Texans to the Arizona Cardinals, and um, not too long afterwards, there was a, or not a, there was Michael Irvin, who was the source, who came out and talked about a conversation he had with DeAndre Hopkins and about why he felt it went down. So a lot of people were up in arms, and I I didn't get a chance to really get into this, but I'll just quickly say I I, I understand you could have got more value um, for that trade. In my mind, I think David Johnson's not broken down. I think uh, if he's healthy, he was uh, definitely showing signs of old. And so I felt they might have had a reason to believe that he can come back to full health and be a dynamic running back. Still, obviously not what you would want to see, but I understood like, okay, that if he could come be a top productive back plus a second round pick, okay. But people were up in arms about the first round pick. Like second round pick is nothing to sneeze at. Besides the fact that it's right after the first round, it's a highly valuable pick. And so that's just me with that. But anyway, so um, outside of the whole uproar of the trade and the shock of it, Michael Irvin comes out and talks about, um, he had a conversation with DeAndre Hopkins cause he didn't understand what happened. And from DeAndre Hopkins point of view, he said that there was a power struggle with him and Bill O'Brien or Bill O'Brien, excuse me, the entire time. Um, and basically that, um, this is, I don't think this was uh, Hopkins, but other people were saying that they felt Bill O'Brien felt that Hopkins had too much control and too much influence in the locker room. And so as a result, there was a conversation they had, and I don't, I'm not sure how long ago it was, but they had a conversation. And Bill O'Brien started off the conversation by uh, not comparing DeAndre Hopkins, that's blown out of portion. He just said, the last time I had to have a conversation like this, it was with Aaron Hernandez. What he meant by that, only Bill O'Brien knows. And so that already started things off shaky, understandably. And so uh, after he said that, uh, they didn't go into too many specifics, but um, Bill O'Brien brought up the fact that DeAndre Hopkins has his uh, mother's children or his children's mother mothers uh around the team too often and so he has children by a couple different women and so uh, i believe he did use the term baby mothers which some people were offended by i mean whatever they are the mother of the babies so uh but anyway it seemed like bill o'brien had an issue with uh him having them around the team so much why he didn't really say and so it see that's pretty much the gist of what Michael Irvin said. And so we don't know the full extent of that meeting, but it seemed like the relationship really soured at that point. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of what happened there. Now, from DeAndre Hopkins point of view, I don't believe he wanted that information out. And so he kind of followed up pretty quickly and was like, you know, um, even that was an unfortunate situation. Uh, him and Bill grew to have a mutual mutual respect for each other. 
And, you know, he was happy for everything he was able to do in Houston. Now, that could be a PR spin. Um, but, and we'll talk about this with Slay. But, honestly, I as from what I know as a coach and a football player, I do believe that he's being honest to say we got a mutual respect to where we can function. Not to say that they liked each other or that he ever forgave them. But I do believe... Um, Obviously, he continued to stay there for years. I believe it was a, at least a year ago. Then, obviously, I feel like they found some common ground, but not enough to obviously let make it work long term. So that's that's that one. Now we got Darius Slay. So Darius Slay uh, was traded to the Eagles, and the Eagles gave him a contract extension. Um, that I believe will end up making him the highest paid corner in the league, which again is just by your yearly salary, uh, whatever. So after he got traded, he went on a rant. Uh, he'd been bottling this up apparently. So Patricia only had, I believe he's only been there for two years. So this had to happen two years ago, uh, cause he spoke about, uh, some early, one of the earliest interactions he had with Matt Patricia was, after some workout Darius Slay had with some other top corners, one was Xavier Rose. I forgot who the other one was. It don't really matter. It was some other corners in the league. And I guess Matt Patricia, for some reason, said he didn't belong out there with them, um, saying that he wasn't in their category or that he wasn't elite. It's been spent so many ways, but essentially the gist is what Slay felt is that Patricia said, you're not elite enough to be working out with those guys. Now, that kind of threw him off, but he was still new to the team, so he wanted to figure out how, you know, he operated as a coach before making that decision. So I guess the big bombshell for him was uh, at practice, there was some receiver that, uh, that beat Slay a couple times, and... He posted the video on social media and was basically saying, you know, like, good job. You got me, whatever. And then so Matt Patricia in a meeting not too long after that, a team meeting, pulled up. He, he was talking about in the context of not being on social media as much and blah, blah, blah. And so um, he brought up the uh, video that Slay posted as an example, and he told him basically, uh, don't suck your opponent's dick. <laughs> he said, don't suck, don't suck the dick of the people that uh, you're going against or that's beating you or whatever he said. And apparently Slate took that very poorly. And he started talking about if Glover Quinn wasn't there. He would. He don't know what he would have did. He blacked out. He was so angry, and so he said after that he completely lost respect for him as a man because he would never say that to uh, Patricia, and so he don't understand why he said it to him and in front of all the team, and so he said he grew to uh, have a working relationship and respect for. Um, Patricia as a coach, but not as a man. And Slay basically said that uh, if it wasn't about football, then he didn't talk to Patricia. He didn't want to talk about his family. He didn't want to talk about anything outside of the field because he showed that he disrespected him as a man. So we're not going to talk on that level. We only going to talk on the football level. So again, this is his perspective. We don't know. Now, those are the two stories. So let's let's break it down as far as which one is worse. Um, so obviously, with both stories, you have a coach taking uh, their certain approach with a star player or perceived to be star player and uh, trying to set an example or set the tone for the team. So. As a coach, uh, I understand, and other people who've been around the, the sport will understand that um, there is two dynamics. There is the tone set by the head coach. A lot of people say the team's the reflection of the head coach, and 
to a lot of extents, that's true. So there's the tone you set there about how you do things and how consistent you are with things. Because the second dynamic on a football team is the star players. And so if you start treating uh, certain players differently, then that sends its own message. And so uh, in professional sports, obviously, there is uh, some understanding that, you know, the better you are, the better treatment you get. But still, at the end of the day, there's a line that you can't cross when just treating star players completely on a different level. And you'll see, you'll see, you see that now with some of the private, well, not now, but you were hearing that from the LA Clippers uh, and NBA. There's a lot of leaks about the team not being happy with how Kawhi Leonard gets all this preferential treatment. And so there's that. So with, as a coach, you got to set that tone and you want to not exactly make an example out of, but you want to show that it's consistent with other players that eat, that might be better. And so th- that's what we got going on here. Uh, two two uh, coaches trying to mark their territory. Now, with uh, DeAndre Hopkins, you got a guy that is producing. You got a guy that does not. I mean, he's supposed to be a good trash talk, but he does not. You know, he's not a, a boisterous personality like an Antonio Brown or T.O. or something. He's kind of, he's very much to himself um, for the most part. And, you know, he's a good, solid dude. And if he's not, we don't hear a whole bunch about him either way. And obviously a lot of his teammates like him. And so you're now got to ask yourself, what's the reason for you butting heads with him? And if you believe the reports is that you felt he had too much influence on the locker room. And yes, um, you can end up in a dynamic where the players are pulling at (laughs) different ends of the rope, as they say. Um, And so if we're not all together following the tune and, you know, um, with the same effort, that can hurt. But. I would say this for a coach, for you to feel like a player is, uh, has too much influence. And we're not talking about a player that's cancerous, disruptive in the locker room or anything like that. We're talking about a a player that people just genuinely follow. That's a situation where you need to let your coaching speak for itself. You need to let the results speak for itself because in that situation, even if they were cancerous, if you're winning games and people are doing well and Hopkins is doing well, then, and he's like, you know, pulling the other way, people are going to be like, ah, yeah, we like you Hopkins, but we kind of winning. And then if Hopkins is not doing well and you're winning, it's like, it sounds like sour grapes. But when you're not winning and you're losing or if you are making questionable decisions, then that's the only real reason you would have a threat. And so for you to approach, and I'm not even talking about how he approached him, but for you to approach him because of his influence, not, not his disruption, his influence, I think that was already a bad idea. Uh, because to me as a coach, if you have a player like that, you want him on your side. You don't want to uh, butt heads with him. Now, as far as his approach to him and what he said, and again, we don't have a full story, but I don't think there's any, um, there's any, uh, realm where it's okay to push people's family away. Obviously, they're not going to be on the practice field, you know, kids running on the field when you're trying to run drills. When it's, you know, in between the lines, I I would say, yes, that should be blocked off to the media, blocked off to everybody except the team. But if they're around the facility, you know, they're in games and, you know, we all probably know about Nuke and his uh, mom and his that story. So if, if they're like, you know, around I don't see why that should ever be a problem. 
That uh, you know what I mean? And I think this offseason more than anything, you're starting to see the real difference. And coaches and people don't realize how different it is. Everybody thinks about Sunday. You line, you show up with a team, your clipboard, your coaches, and you call plays. Like, no, it's go, it's way more that goes into it. I mean, dude, just think about Harbaugh at Michigan taking them to Rome or wherever he took them to. Like, it goes deep when you got big pockets. And so you hear stories, uh, some players coming out like, why, why about Bruce Arians in Tampa? Why, why t- Tom want to go there? You hear about, he does tailgates every game, family tailgates, family, the players, the coaches, everybody after each game, win or loss, they get some food, drinks, like I believe might be home games, but like it, he, he has a different atmosphere and that's not mandated nowhere. That's just what he chooses to do. And so, when you think about being a uh, um, football team, like there are certain rules, but for the most part, Bill O'Brien gets to say how he wants things done. And for him to say, I don't want your family around, that's just weird. And, you know, because at best, it's just tone deaf. And at worst, it's some racist stuff. So I don't know. I, I mean, it just it, it doesn't pass the optics test. Um, and so that's pretty bad. Obviously they found a working relationship and I'm not really going to bring the trade into it as far as the value, but I'm just looking at what, how it went down. Now, Matt Patricia, um, with Darius Slay. So here's the difference. Darius Slay, definitely a good corner. Would anybody call him the best corner in the league? I'm not sure. Um, but I arguably definitely a really good corner. Um, So (laughs) the approach here, of course, is trying to drive home your point about how you want the team ran by making an example of a top player. And so obviously a lot of people talk about Belichick and how he did did that with Tom Brady and Patricia following in those footsteps and even to an extent Bill O'Brien following in those footsteps. Um but I don't think that's a Bill Belichick thing. Like I said, that dynamic exists. It's just on how you choose to approach it. So in this case, uh, he calls them out in front of the team, or Slay out in front of the team instead of in private. And Slay felt like this could have been something they could have talked about privately. Um, he felt like he was being targeted to be embarrassed and all that stuff. And so to that point, I agree with him. That was the intention to embarrass him, but also to show the team like we're not going to stand for this. The issue comes when you're not winning once again, because now this wasn't a case where everybody's like, hey, we all follow Slay like Slay was a good player. So obviously he has some sway, but it wasn't like, hey, we all love Slay. So it wasn't like he was like turning the locker room against you. You just want to make an example of him. And Slay didn't take it. He didn't take it well. Okay, that's cool. Even the first comment when he said he's not elite, it's the tough love trying to push him to be better. Didn't take it well. So obviously your approach didn't match up with Slay. Now, the whole thing about saying, you know, sucking the man's whatever. To me. Personally, that's a very mild thing to hear on a football team, like a very mild thing. That is not something that is super vulgar or over the line like there. I have heard way worse things and I was a player. So you're talking about, you know, 18, not even 18, 17, 16 years old. I've had way worse things said to me and about me, and about my family, (laughs) and so obviously there's, you know, difference in times and generations, but still, and then you get to a point, you're making money, and you got to be able to understand as a coach, these these are grown men making money, you can't always do it that way, and even if you can, some players will take it, some won't, so um, did he say something that I thought was over the line? No, because it's a common expression it obviously wasn't him like making a, a point about his sexuality. 
it was obviously a metaphor to say, you know, be competitive. Uh, could have been said in a different way. Maybe. I mean, you know, he could have switched it where Slay was cool with it, but somebody else was offended. You never know. So I don't think it was over the top. Um, and I do think the approach of doing it in front of the team could have been different, but I also don't think that was over the top. So Slay's reaction to it, I thought was overboard. And so um, there's other reports, anonymous people saying that after that, Slay was a cancer. They said Slay, Slay says he had a professional relationship and he did what he was told. But there's other people saying he was a cancer. They saying he was undermining Patricia and other coaches that, you know, he was openly bad mouthing them when they went around. He was, you know, uh, basically saying they didn't know what they was talking about. And that that's where you become a cancer. And that's when you start talking about affecting the locker room in a negative way. We're not talking about, oh, we like Slay. We just listen to Slay. We're talking about somebody keeps talking crap and pulling in a different direction. And whether or not everybody follows that, there's going to be some people that follow it. And then it just, you know, that's why they call it a cancer. It just spreads slowly. And so even if you love Matt Patricia, he makes a call that doesn't work. In the back of your mind, you're thinking about what Slay said. And so that that is a very different situation um, as far as how he reacted to it, um, if the, those reports are true. But anyway, back to just the whole incident of it. I think uh, Patricia definitely has a lot of room to improve how he could approach that. Not only um, in understanding the player, because so you're not you're not gonna know every player's um, you know style right away. It's gonna take some time. So I'm not blaming him for that. What I am blaming him for is that you're a first time coach. And so, or first time head coach, um, it, it is probably in your best interest not to try to pull the big dog card. Like, yes, you can set the tone in other ways. Um, and I think honestly, as much crap as people gave him, I thought Freddie Kitchens did a good job of really setting the tone of being a game man or not a game man of being a team manager with Cleveland and you saw like if you watched the, their whole behind the scenes series and how he want to hold people accountable now situationally and everything else obviously he was over his head but I, I thought he did a good job of at least understanding like the lines Patricia seems like he just came in and like some people say thinking he was Bill Belichick and you you have to earn a certain perception to do that, whether it's real or not. Super Bowls help, yes. Um, coaching great other great players helps, yes, especially at your position. Um, all that stuff helps, but you still you got no head coach experience. And so that cachet isn't exactly the same. Um, and obviously he's bringing in a lot more players that are from the Patriot way and understand how he coaches. But in this point with Slay, he just kind of, you know, went for it. So overall, which one do I think was worse? Because I don't think either one was absolutely cr- I seen some people just virtue signaling. Uh, they really were going for it, trying so hard to be pissed about all this. And maybe they know more information than me, but I don't think either one was that egregious. But I'm going to go with um, Hopkins and the Texans. See, it's weird because I do respect certain aspects. Like, I'm glad he called them privately. Like, he didn't try to do it in front of the team. He more or less tried to, you know come to a a one-on-one understanding. Um, He went about it the wrong way, but we don't know what else he said in that meeting. Um, But I I don't like the whole philosophy in general of trying to challenge the player with the most influence, but at least uh, he had that part of it. Um, And it's hard to say if we don't know the other details. But still, again, the philosophy is just bad. 
and and really like the whole family thing. Obviously, that's the big part that stuck with uh, Hopkins for him to bring that up. With Patricia, again, I think very miscalculated, but at the end of the day, I don't think it was nothing crazy outside of a coaching, uh, you know, a coach's capacity of what they would do. And I think Slay's reaction to it was a little overblown. So that's just me. But anyway, go to the comment section. Let me know what you think. Was Bill O'Brien um, and his situation with Hopkins, as far as the actual situation that we know, was that worse than Patricia's situation with Slay? Not talking about what picks they got. We're just talking about the situation. So let me know in the comment section. Thumbs up, subscribe, share it around. Uh, get the conversation started. And thank you for listening.